Hey, strong ones. Welcome to today's episode. Today we have Liz from the land down under Australia, which I was super excited to have her on the show. She is a survival of childhood trauma, the founder of Heal for Life Foundation, which I believe, is that just north of Sydney? Is that right? Two, uh, we're two hours north of Sydney. Yeah. Ah, okay, cool. Um, she is internationally renowned for speaking and has delivered many papers at international conferences on the Heal for Life method on healing. She is the author of two books and a new book coming out that is called Heal for Life. She has tons of awards and she's helped a lot of other psychologists with this approach of how to heal your life from the looking at it, the lens from trauma. Liz, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah. I was thumbing through your book and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to like spend a lot of time reading this book because it looks so good. I'm really excited about that. Uh, first, we started chatting a little bit before we hit the record button about the effects of childhood trauma and mm -hmm. the percentage of things that kind of like, I don't even know how to describe it, but things that are mask, that mask trauma. And yeah. the percentage are so high that like, um, what is it? Let me look at the numbers real quick because I'm going to get myself. About, no, you can talk about things that I'll help you. You can talk about drug addiction. You can talk about right. alcohol, alcoholism. You can talk about drug. You can talk about all our main, the main problems in our society. And eating disabilities, the majority, the eat, eating problems, the vast majority of people have also suffered from childhood trauma. Right. So then, but nobody is doing enough research to say is what's the link. There's lots of research on genes and epigenes and uh, hormones, but they don't get back to the core question. Is how come such a vast majority have suffered from childhood trauma? Mm. And I've personally never met anyone who's suffering from depression and I've met some fairly famous people on the conferences, et cetera. Mm -hmm. When I said, oh, what, what happened in your childhood? They will say something like, oh, well, my mother left home when I was three, and then I had this, and then that happened. But they don't consider that that might be the reason why they have a depression. They have just mm -hmm. gone on a self-healing, a, a medication, or to, they will do anything to avoid looking at the key, the key problem because people don't want to look or acknowledge childhood trauma. Right. Yeah. There's why still a terrible stigma about saying you're a survivor of child abuse? I've no idea why, but I do. I, I do know why. But it's really sad. Why do you think? Because I think first, let's define trauma. Can we go there? Yeah. Sure. Would you like me to take give you the yeah. scientific answer? Yes. Yes. So that trauma is defined. It is more emotion than the brain can deal with. Mm. It appears to be life threatening in an age appropriate way. Mm. So if you're a baby in a cot, what is life-threatening to you, which might be a spider on the wall because your mother's screaming, <laughs> uh, quite different from what it is to a 10-year-old right. or a 15-year-old, obviously. And it overwhelms the ability to adapt. So basically your brain is faced with such overwhelming fear, it has a final cut-down freezing mechanism which just stops. And at that moment when we, when, when we are totally traumatized, we don't remember it. And furthermore, one part of our brain, the amygdala in our right brain, takes on board everything around us so that if any of the things we received in our senses we hear again, we get what is called triggered. But I'm getting ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's the whole, but that, I mean, the whole thing of healing is to heal from our triggers from our trauma. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, so use the word trauma very loosely. And, and, and they do, and, I think. And you've really got to define it. And it's difficult because there's physical trauma of the right. body, which is the same. Right. But it's, it, it, so, you know, it, it's, I think there's, it really does need another word to mean what I just described. Right. Which is what neuroscientists call trauma. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah. Um, in your book, you talk a lot about the impact it has on the brain and the nervous system. Can you talk a little bit of just the, the fact that you mentioned how the brain may not even remember it, but yeah. the body may remember it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, sure. So what happens when our body, when we are overwhelmed by fear, 
enormous stress horm hormones released. And there's mm -hmm. three parts of the brain that they actually finally, in the moment of actual trauma, we are cut off from three critical parts of, of our brain. And I'm saying this very simplistically because right. it's the only way to understand things. So one part of the brain that's cut off is the prefrontal cortex. What mm -hmm. does that do? It gives us the, the ability to think, to, to, to think consequences of our actions, to be aware of other people. I'm sure you're, everyone listening or watching will, will know these moments. I've lost my car keys. Where are they? Where are they? The more I worry about, the more frightened I am about finding them, the less able I am to find them. Mm -hmm. So in the five moment of freezing, prefrontal cortex, any ability to be aware of other people or aware of one's actions is cut off. The other part that's cut off is the hippocampus. In the left, this is in the left brain. Anyway, the mm -hmm. hippocampus is our, where we store our memories. It's like the filing cabinet of the brain. Right. So at this final moment of freeze, at this moment of trauma, the hippocampus is completely cut off. The hippocampus is also um, our sense of self. So mm -hmm. a lot of survivors of child abuse have a very poor sense of self. And it's a part of the brain that becomes underdeveloped because of the impact of stress hormones on it. So our ability to remember our learning capacity is really compromised. So those of us who've suffered from trauma very often have difficulties at school, have difficulties remembering things. And that's because of this action of the stress hormones. But the third part, and this then is a great clue to how we can heal. Third part is Broca's area. And this is uniquely in the left side of the brain. Hmm. You, we all know speechless terror, that moment when you can hmm. no longer even say. Uh, it, it can suddenly be activated, this freeze mechanism, which is through the vagus system. Um, if suddenly someone screams at you, or if the boss says, what are you doing? And is outraged. Uh, everyone's had that moment when they just can't speak. They go, and then later they think, why didn't I say something? Why didn't I scream? It's because you're at that moment when the Broca's area is cut off. So those three areas are cut off when we suffer from trauma. Mm -hmm. And that has a huge impact on us because every time we are reminded of the trauma through our senses. Mm -hmm. So if when I was be, suffered, if I, when I suffered from trauma, um, I could smell mothballs, right? Whatever was happening. Mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. um, then evermore, when I smell mothballs, the same three parts of my brain will be impacted. I won't be able to think properly. Um, I won't be able to properly give it, put my thoughts together. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't be able to remember. So this is what impacts us, the, uh, us developmentally, as well as it impacts us physically mm -hmm. through the fight, flight, freeze mechanism, which people may be more familiar with, the, the way you know, our bodies tense up, our muscles tense, uh, all in the way we, don't, we, don't, we have no digestion when we're, when we're in freeze. So right. our body and our brain are impacted every time we're reminded of a trauma. And, mm -hmm. and that's what we have to heal from. Mm -hmm. And that's what people don't really emphasize, I, I think enough, because uh, uh, we've got guests this week and just saying to them, what triggers you? And many of them go, oh, I know, I get really frightened when, and they've never thought of it as a trigger. Mm. They've just thought, that's just the way I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get frightened when someone shouts loudly. I react if someone's got alcoholic breath. Mm. Um, uh, it, it can be, it can be, um, it can be food. Mm -hmm. My own sister was triggered by the smell of cheese. Mm. What does that mean? No, she didn't say I'm triggered by the smell of cheese. From an early age, she would say, no, I hate cheese. I hate cheese. I can't stand cheese. And that's really difficult not to eat cheese. <laughs> There's cheese in everything. <laughs> only about five years ago, that I said to her, um, Lucy is my sister's name, Lucy, why don't you deal with the fact that with your, uh, your, your cheese, your trigger of cheese? And she said, it's not a trigger. Not everything in the world is a trigger, Liz. I'm just allergic to cheese. And I said to her, and I suggested to her that she connected, and, and that's our sort of model, which is to connect with the fear and mm. then empower the little girl and to remember what happened. So she remembered that night what had happened mm -hmm. and what had happened was my father in her little girl's mind had tried to kill her and his hands that which were around her throat smelt of cheese wow so when she had remembered that released the fear of thinking her daddy was going to kill her 
when she had what we call empowered herself, mm. which is from Levine's work, that is she killed her daddy. Um, and she killed him, in fact, by a goanna eating her because there'd been one in her bedroom. They're giant lizards. Okay? Oh my. So she got this giant lizard to eat her. So mm -hmm. when she had done that, and when then she'd nurtured her little girl and, and as an adult, her adult Lucy, saying to her little Lucy, that must have been terrifying, daddy trying to kill you. Mm. Then her body could let go. Her brain could let go of it. Her, the way she would gag because that throat, her throat muscles would constrict whenever she smelt cheese huh. was completely gone. So now she eats cheese happily. Yeah. You know what I mean? So lots of people have allergies. They have mm -hmm. uh, phobias and they, they come back to a trauma that's not resolved. Mm. It, it impacts on a huge number of people who don't even think of themselves as survivors of childhood trauma. Right. And that's a little something that you mentioned a little bit um, in your book about the fact that we bring our trauma at a middle school versus really seeing the impact that it has on it. And we minimize the effect of like, it's not that big of an um, effect on our bodies. How can you, what do you do with when people voice that or like they understand their trauma, but they're not, I wouldn't say they're not dealing with it, but it's the fact of like, they're not maybe not recognizing the big impact because they don't think it had, it's a small trauma compared to some other traumas. I think that, uh, nature, God, whoever, whatever, um, means that we have to deny things that have hurt us very badly. Um, we have to deny things that are very scary because it's like our adult self protects us from the fear. Because mm -hmm. it's like a whole part of our brain says, that is so scary, do not go there. Mm -hmm. Make it about anything else at all, but don't make it about fear. So it's, it's like our brain protects us from fear, but mm -hmm. the only way we can heal ourselves is by embracing the fear. Mm. And so, so many people mm -hmm. uh, working with somebody on Monday and um, uh, she's been in bed for three weeks, uh, hasn't been able to get out of bed, hasn't been able to do anything. 10 years ago, she uh, did a healing week with us. And all the time she was in bed, she said, I knew it was my trauma, Liz, but I still couldn't do anything about it. And she even knew finally to contact me. So uh, this denial is absolutely huge from all of us, including myself. I mean, I'll do anything rather than deal with some memory I haven't yet got to. I'll, you know, I'll avoid it just as much as anybody else. Yeah. It's, it's, it's natural. And we just have to say, am I worth, am I worth it? Mm -hmm. The fear experienced of whatever it was as a child, mm -hmm. whatever it was, it's so silly to destroy our lives as adults because of something that happened to us maybe quite by mistake. Nobody, it is, it's not a blame game. Right. It's not about who did it to us. Mm -hmm. It's about healing ourselves from fear so that we can live lives in love, with love, happily, mm -hmm. <laughs> joyously. Mm -hmm. And it's this fear of, of exploring the unknown that stops people from mm -hmm. investigating what happened to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's nothing scary about it. Is there a time and place when it's not helpful for people to voice the trauma, but they need to, there's other physicality or physical ways or like a, that somatic approach to healing versus actually voicing it? Um, it's a choice. Somatic mm. does, um, so many somatic methods do take you to the emotion and release it from the body. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I mean, I like go absolutely releasing the fear and remembering enough of what it was about because each time I remember something that happened in my childhood, um, it makes sense of me. Mm. <laughs> it makes me understand myself. It doesn't mean that I blame my father or go, oh, he was a terrible, terrible man for sexually abusing me. That's mm -hmm. not part of it. What it's done is, is brought me to a realization he did that. And no, it wasn't okay. But mm -hmm. he was obviously in pain and whatever. But importantly for me, it cleared up a whole lot of emotions I'm, I might have had towards men, towards men who look like him, towards mm -hmm. uh, the church because he was in the church. So I've cleared up a whole lot of other false beliefs that came about mm -hmm. because of the not remembered. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's not about, it's really not a blame game. And I think mm -hmm. while it's a blame game, that's, that we, 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 we're not healing ourselves. It's about mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I heal myself in order to be a happier person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not to blame that person or spend the rest of my life as a victim saying, how dare he mm 
he, she have done that to me. I'll never recover. I'll never be the same again. You know, right. you know, my life is ruined. Well, that's a choice. Mm, yeah. Your life doesn't have to be ruined by anything that happens in your life. It's mm -hmm. a choice if you want your life to be ruined. Mm -hmm. And that's okay if you want to make that choice. Mm -hmm. But then don't blame the whole world, particularly the person who committed this act against you. Mm -hmm. you, know? you see it when someone's child dies, some people are transformed through it. They grow through it. Right. You know, agonizing as it is, others are destroyed by it. Mm -hmm. It's a choice. Mm -hmm. Do you, so I'm, I'm big on the word hope. Like hope has always been like my anchor. Um, and I love um, Les Miserables. And I love that storyline. Um, I've never read the book, but I love the movie. It's like on my list of things to do. <laughs> But after reading my book, <laughs> yes, of course, yeah. <laughs> um, my question, I remember it, there was like a new series or like a new um video or new movie on it, and I went out and saw it with some of my friends, and I said, This movie is so much about hope. Mm -hmm. And one of my friends said, no, it's not. And I was like, but, but every character in that movie had a choice. Yeah. to either start mm -hmm. over and ch yeah and change or to stay on that misery path mm -hmm. and what do you have to say with hope and choice well hopelessness is when people kill themselves mm -hmm. people kill themselves when there's no hope they don't kill themselves when they're in great fear or terror they kill themselves when they just go there is no hope for me, hope is everything. Right. <laughs> our whole, everything, all my work is about giving people hope. It's about right. saying to people, if you're fed up with you have bad relationships, if you're fed up with always being sick, if you're fed up, again, this week, someone with irritable bowel syndrome, if you're fed up with all these things, well, you can change it. It's a mm -hmm. choice. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, God, whatever mm -hmm. anyone wants to call this higher self, right. it gives us for me a choice. And... Uh, However, I want to add to that, there are some people like in Les Miserables who what has happened to them is so overwhelmingly dreadful, so impossible, they just can't find that light of hope. Um, and for me, the role of people like myself is to help people find that bit of hope. Right, you know, yeah. About it, for people to look at it and go, oh, I, I can heal. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can change. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's possible. So giving people hope to me is critically important, but I think we mustn't also be judgmental of people who just don't have the strength to find it. But I'm here for the vast majority of people who, who need the encouragement to find hope. And when they find hope, they find love, they find, you know, relationships. Uh -huh. Yeah. Everybody wants, everyone wants to have, be happy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, going back to like more of the somatic approach, yeah. is there any guidelines um, for the listeners who may find that talking or just like traditional therapy, it may not be helpful or what are some of like the guidelines? Cause you list a little bit of like side effects of trauma yeah. and how trauma lives within our lives and our being of like depression and eating disorders. Mental uh, illness. Melta yeah, mental illness. Is, is there like signs also of like somatic approach to healing will be a, maybe a little bit more successful for you or, or have a bigger yeah. impact? Okay, so talking doesn't heal us. Mm. Now, science tells us that cognitive behavioral therapy, anything which involves just the left side of the brain, that's the conscious part of the brain, mm -hmm. is not going to be effective with trauma because trauma is in the right part of the brain. So if we work with the left side of the brain before we've he he accessed our trauma, all uh -huh. we do is feel inadequate. So if you feel that you're stupid um, and you go to a therapist and they spend the ages saying, look in the mirror every day and say, I'm clever. <laughs> well, then after a month of this CBT, you go, well, it didn't bloody work. I'm, I knew I was hopeless and I really am stupid, right? So for me, you've got to uncover 
you've got to go to the right brain, which is logical, which is what mm -hmm. neuroscience says. We access our trauma through the right brain. So speaking therapies have now been discredited in the last 20 years as not the effective way of healing. Mm -hmm. Somatic, of course, works because it's a way of accessing your body. But for me, again, I just say, I just think it's quicker to go to the right brain because that's kind of the most important <laughs> part. And that then unlocks the, the, the somatics. But for some people, um, somatic, uh, you know, and things like kinesiology, all those things all aid. I don't think you use just one mm. thing when you're healing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, do, I use lots of things, bone therapy and massage, help me get rid of the way my legs always wanted to run away I yeah. use kinesiology to kind of make get rid of all the bits that were left in my body and mm -hmm. um, i think we need a combination but as a mm. survivor i know that the most important and first thing is to actually learn how to access my right brain mm -hmm. and know how to release the fear so mm -hmm. it's the emotions mm -hmm. whether held in my body or held in my brain mm -hmm. or, that that is the key to it because it's the emotion of fear that impacts on the release of stress hormones, which have impacted on us so badly. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is change the impact of the trauma on our brain. So we're trying to lessen the release of stress hormones. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, then we don't need antidepressant medication because we've done it naturally. Right. Yeah. Am I making uh, sense? Am no, I yes, 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 yes. This is um, huge. Do you think there's any, I mean, um, it's kind of like a journey of life of healing. Do you ever think there is a time in a frame where you're like, I've healed, I'm done. I don't have to work on that stuff anymore. Or it just like what you're saying, it just lessens and we, it's a continuous process of healing. I think it's a choice. I know lots mm -hmm. of them, eight and a half thousand people. Have been, I know lots of people have been to our place and they said after a couple of years, okay, I've done enough as I want to. I'm now just going to have a happy life. I don't want to look at any more. And they've just got on with their lives. Other people, it's a journey. It's a bit like a spiritual journey. People choose how much they want, they want to right. learn. Right. And some people just have one trauma that's really impacted one area of their lives uh -huh. and, they, and they heal from that and there's nothing else to heal from. Other people, I had, I had trauma all the way through my childhood because of sexual abuse and satanic ritual abuse. I mean, there's a whole mile of different abuse. Yeah. So I've, had to, I've had to unpeel it like an onion and do mm -hmm. the first bit that I could deal with first and, and gradually learn the rest. But that's my journey. It, it, everybody chooses, but they choose. Mm -hmm. so they choose. Do I want to unpack this, this um, Pandora's box or not? Right. All I say is just don't blame the rest of the world if you choose not to unpack it. <laughs> don't, don't yell, don't yell and, or say to all your friends, oh, it's so dreadful, I don't have any friendships. Well, do something about it. Right. Please from what is stopping you feeling you can trust other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. It's, I will say again, it's a choice. And when people begin to realize the brain is plastic mm -hmm. and change ourselves, if we choose to, then, then this blame of blaming everyone else may stop a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Do you, um, what are your thoughts? I mean, we live in a world, like I think what, a lot of times where my mind goes with like trauma, I always compare it to like a physical aspect of um, like an yeah. injury type of thing. Yeah. And it's a matter of most people get injured um, when they're doing physical activity. It's not a matter if they don't, it's just a matter of like when, is that the same with trauma or? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, you can have a broken leg and choose not to heal it and, right. and be, you know, and being plastered for the rest of your life. People don't because our medical system encourages them and puts them in plaster and they accept the fact they can have seven weeks of being in plaster. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about trauma, people don't think of it like that. They don't think I'm going to, I'm going to have to heal from this. It's going to take a week, a month, whatever, or six months. And I need to get, uh, they, they, they kind of somehow think they should miraculously get over it. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, or it's because of them, it's because we call them personality disorders. It's because um, doctors have this thing about there's I don't believe in mental illness and physical illness. There is illness. Mm. If you're mentally ill, you have right. an illness of the brain. The mm -hmm. brain is an organ like the lung or heart. Right. The brain can heal. 
the brain mm -hmm. can change just like the lung or the heart or, or anywhere else. So I always say to our, our, our guests, don't think of yourselves as mentally ill. You're not. You're physically ill and you can heal. Right. And just like physical illness, you may have to work really hard on it. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens with physical illness. If you've got cancer, you, you, know, you have to stay in bed. You have to do, the, you know, you, you follow the regime. Mm -hmm. it's insane if you want to heal from trauma. Yeah. Follow what is... And heal. Um, <laughs> and, and this is in my book. One of the things a psychologist really asked me to do is say, just give me a whole lot of tools, Liz. Just give me what I can do every day to right. start working towards my own healing. And I thought, yeah, that's really important for people to have ideas of what can I do to unstuck right. myself. Yeah, yeah. What's the importance or the importance of childhood play and that childlike spirit with healing, especially oh, with, with like childhood trauma oh joy to take it one further back uh -huh. chapter on this too joy is one of the things that a whole lot of people who suffered from trauma are frightened of don't feel yeah. safe and and don't feel they're worthy of so it's just as important for us to unlock joy in our lives as mm -hmm. it is to unlock fear and anger and sadness mm -hmm. all of the emotions are equally important and for each one of us some people joy has been really badly impacted. So then we really have to work on, on discovering and, and losing the fear of joy mm -hmm. and, and then learning how to feel joy. You don't, can't just turn it on. Right. It's very, very scary. How would you define joy? I'm curious. Interesting question. Um, I could say scientifically by, by the release of, if you like, happy hormones as, compa as compared to stress hormones. Right. I, I, I would say scientifically it's by the release of the oxytocin, dopamine, and the happy hormones as compared to the, you know, the, the sad, fearsome hormones, if you want uh -huh. to say scientifically. And, and what does that do? The release of those hormones uh, makes me feel light, lifts my spirits in the opposite way to what fear does to my spirits. Mm -hmm. I will feel it in my body, often the stomach, because the stomach is the center for a lot of neurons are in the stomach. So I will feel it physically as, as well as in my brain, just as I feel fear physically in my body mm -hmm. as well as in my brain. So mm -hmm. it's another emotion um, impacted by hormones. And without it, if we're not practicing it, just like everything else, we, 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 we don't know what it is. I've, I've right. worked with people who've never really, they don't know what joy is. Mm -hmm. I've worked with people who don't know what a touch is. They, whenever they're hugged, they don't even know that feeling. Mm -hmm. It's never happened to them before. So then it's a, a, very, a very slow process of getting them to sh show them what a mother's feel was like and then getting mm -hmm. them to feel that for themselves. Same with joy. Mm -hmm. It's, not, it's mm -hmm. not an overnight change. If you've never right. got, you can't go, yippee, let's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you can start doing laughing therapy. You can start doing and start working on it as you release the fear. We have to do our lives in balance. I mean, right. about, oh, it's all this getting into this fear. No, it isn't. It's both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On our healing programs, we have a joy day. Right. Yeah. And everyone real discovers how they feel towards joy. Mm -hmm. And some people, it's the worst day of the week. Mm. And, they, and they get very triggered and very upset and they have to do a lot of release of fear because fear is connected to joy. Can you do, sh share more on that? <laughs> okay. So that, I, get, I don't even know how to answer or ask a question based off of that. I understand what you're saying about fear is connected to joy. Yeah. Um, okay, shall I give you an example? Yeah. yeah. So if somebody something happened to them at a kid's party mm -hmm. then their triggering is associated with an emotion of joy mm -hmm. um in fact I, I i worked with someone i did a video of it actually i was playing it just a couple of weeks ago to somebody um this person has never felt joy in her life mm -hmm. okay she said to me liz i've never felt joy she actually works with us and she said every time it's joy day i go into kind of oh my god it's joy day and i'm not i so she put on a pretend act of <laughs> isn't this funny oh I'm, I'm having a great but inside it was like this isn't yeah. happening yeah and she thought it was connected with when she was eight years old and something happened at a party mm -hmm. um and so um we did she drew and went back 
she went back through the years and this is where trauma is so extraordinary she went back to when she was in the cot and she was all alone and people were having a party and fun and she as a little baby was lying there screaming and no one came hmm. because they were all having fun at a party that in the end was life-threatening and more emotion than she could deal with so her amygdala in her right brain her fear center connected the sound of people having fun of laughing hmm. with overwhelming fear so once again she released that absolute fear of being there all alone and no one coming and no one's ever going to come and i'm going to die here in my cot right when she released that fear and then <laughs> remember she just held herself and, as the adult self and just mm-hmm. loved herself and cuddled her and said, I'm here, I'm here. Mm-hmm. Well, now she laughs naturally like a, a real person. And as she said, she feels joy. And, and when we'd finished doing this, the, this process, this work, um, she said, oh, I should start singing Ba Ba Black Sheep. And I said, oh, do you want me to put on some fun kids songs? She said, oh, yes. And I put on and she started dancing like a little kid. And you could almost see her whole body being able to embrace joy and having fun. It, right. It's, it's, great video because you just see this person transforming mm-hmm. um, and you know she's in her 50s that's beautiful so i love it sad? i mean you know you reach 50 and you've never actually experienced joy it, i mean it's sad but i'm also happy for her at the same oh, time yeah. because yeah. like at that i don't know if there's like my mind again is thinking like, there has to be different intensities of joy too of like course. that intensity of joy and that, like, I, I just think of like, just like overflowing mm-hmm. with that emotion um, and just like this beautiful waterfall. Like there's just, there's so much, uh, she's at that moment, it sounded like she was so abundant, abundant in, in joy that other people may never be able to experience that type of joy that she had because she's never tasted it in yeah. that way. And so I, I, it is sad that she's never had that her life, but at the same time, it's so, I'm so excited that she does. Exactly. Yeah. You know, exactly. I'm mm. absolutely. My question goes to the fact of childhood trauma and as adults, as we heal from those, the aspect of re-traumatization when voicing your stories and telling Uh, (laughs) and how do you yes what are yeah (laughs) so so i'm only talking about like with her Mm -hmm. remembering this one incident releasing all the fear right but the sort of weird idea of slowly going back or just Mm -hmm. releasing a bit of it is is just awful and also what doesn't help if i just tell you my story oh i was in a girl's home and i was beaten every day by the nuns oh i was in a girl's home it's my identity the more times i tell you what has happened to me yeah. without releasing the fear i'm actually re-victimizing myself re-traumatizing myself because i'm verbalizing mm-hmm. when i release the feelings they've gone forever mm-hmm. verbalizing alone does no good at all. We've just had a Royal Commission here into sexual abuse in institutions. And it was brilliantly done and fabulously handled and really, really great. But I'm now getting the effects of all the people who bravely went to the Royal Commission, told their story, Mm -hmm. and then they did get, yes, some counselling. But that became their identity for a year, talking about, yes, I was a victim of child abuse, etc. And so they've really made their brains take it on in their conscious memory as this is my identity this makes me important because i was a a victim of child abuse so um it's very very important that we tell our story once and release the fear right Um, story i mean it's not story it's just remembering vaguely what happened we don't have to remember all the details right people's details i mean details it's the brain doesn't retain details the brain retains the emotions because it's the emotions the brain is trying to protect us from fear Mm -hmm. because the brain wants life to be preserved. Mm -hmm. So the amygdala, this fear center in the brain is in all animals. Mm -hmm. 
and he once had a horse who's had suffered from trauma they're just the same as adults my, my horse won't go through a gate because obviously he was once beaten when going through a gate you know, i mean mm -hmm. trauma is the way animals humans how we preserve life mm -hmm. what reminds us not to touch something that's burning it's all of the things you know i mean it's fear is is a very important emotion it's just this when it is an overwhelming emotion that in humans uh, it has this rather disastrous um, impact on us. Mm -hmm. But I think if we all just remembered it in the simplest way, it, it, we, would, we might start healing a lot more. Mm, right. Like, like the horse going through the gate. You know, you, you think, okay, you're frightened of going through the gate. That's no good. Let's work on, and I don't know how you get rid of a horse's trauma, but <laughs> work on it. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, but, or, you know, I take you through gently or whatever. But with humans, we kind of just say, no, we, we just won't go through the gate. We'll just, we'll just go. We'll just go the long way around. Mm -hmm. I won't have relationships. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I won't, I'll always be frightened of spiders. I, I won't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's uh -huh. just, it's like my sister with cheese. I just don't eat cheese, you know. It's right, right, <laughs> right. So with, um, as more people are recognizing trauma in their life and, voicing it or feeling like they need to voice it what are some like precautions or advice that you have for them because of that risk of reliving that story okay you know so I mean? I've never yeah i do um basically we only remember when they were in a safe place mm -hmm. we don't start just people have panic attacks they have anxiety attacks when mm -hmm. their brain is saying i want to deal with this i want to deal with this but that, that and they don't know what to do Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it, we never remember what we're not ready to remember. Mm. So I don't, I haven't experienced anyone in all my years who has suddenly had a complete memory. And, it, it, and of course it may happen, please, I'm not saying it doesn't. Right. But I think you only start remembering when you are actually in a, in a safe relationship or a safe place and are ready to remember. That's my experience. I, I'm not meaning there isn't an exception to the rule. I right. think to be frightened about it overwhelming you is a fear that holds people back. Mm -hmm. And of course, everybody needs, by a safe place, a safe therapist or, you know, a program like ours. I, I'm not meaning people should sit at home and start thinking that they're able to start really unlocking this stuff on their own because they won't feel safe enough to do so. Right. Yeah. 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 I've never been, I, I always have to have, I can't like my sister can do it on her own. I can't even now, if I know something's happening and I've suddenly been really triggered, I have to find one of somebody here and I have to, they have to be with me and sit with me while I remember because my little girl doesn't feel safe enough just with me. Right. A lot of people you, you can't do this work on their own. Others can mm -hmm. people discover it for themselves, but they have to have, feel it's, it's people's own fear. It's like panic attacks. Right. But so scared. What's happening? I don't know what's happening. Oh, I've got to stop it. I've got to stop it. I've got to hold in, hold in this stuff. Mm -hmm. going, oh, I'm feeling frightened. Mm -hmm. Because the way you get trigger or come out of a panic attack or anxiety attack is mm -hmm. to acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. When you acknowledge how you are feeling, it goes from the right brain to the left brain because you're verbalizing, which is mm -hmm. Rocker's area. And when you verbalize, you lessen the fear. That's how you stop yourself being mm -hmm. overwhelmed by an emotion. You name mm -hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very simple. <laughs> Sit up, get on a plane um, and be frightened of flying. Turn to the person next to you and say, I am frightened of flying. The acknowledgement will stop you being as frightened. It's when we're fighting an emotion mm. that it tries to overwhelm us because it's saying, no, no, you're frightened. You're frightened. So when we acknowledge fear, we uh -huh. minimize fear. Yeah. You, are you familiar with the phrase love over fear? Uh, well, yeah, I believe love overcomes fear, yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. But uh, with what you're talking about fear, it's also because sometimes when people say that, it almost feels like they're negating fear. Like there is no fear. There's only love. Like you can only choose love. And um, what's the combo of facing our fears and going to those de like those deep parts of us of the unknown with love At the, what you just said i mean we cannot any emotion suppress it love is stronger than fear so love has allowed me to go into my fear mm. but love love can only allow me to go into my fear love of my adult self love of my inner child self mm -hmm. will help me to go to the fear but 
you have to release the fear. Love can't change the way the brain, this is scientific. Love can't change the amygdala. The right brain <laughs> amygdala is activated by fear. So you've got to release the fear or you ain't going to, you, you can't do something. I mean, I suppose everyone can, you know, God can do whatever, but right. scientifically right. only God can do it. And let's not all hope for miracles. It's like, yes, God can take away cancer, but we also go to the doctor and take the right medication. Well, as far as I'm concerned, if we've got trauma, yes, a God can just take it away, but equally God and love can give us the courage to go into the fear. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, you know, I, I, we, it's like with children, you can never say to a child, oh, there's nothing to be frightened of. You're right. Negating, yeah. You say, mm -hmm. yes, it's scary. Yeah. Just say it's scary. And now we're going to deal with it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> But, but we, we're still going to cross the road or we're still going to stand here and wait for the train, even though the train is scary. But you can breathe out the fear. You can say, I'm really, I'm really frightened. And that's okay to be frightened. You know, yeah. It's a very big train that's coming in. Uh-huh. Yeah. Not do anything. That's Adults good. are there for children to understand how to, um, well, not to control their fear. Oh, how to regulate their emotions. That's the key role of a mother in the first year of a child's life is to, mm. for a child to learn how to regulate their emotions. Yeah. A um, couple things. Um, self-love. Um, I asked this on a, with another guest, what is self-love without the other? Like you gave the example of like, as you are going through some memories or you need that someone else in the room, mm. how, and me. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes, yes, me. yes, 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 yes. And you, is it possible just to have self-love without the other? Do you understand my question on that? I mean, self-love without a sense of, of God, a sense of a higher power? Yeah, I guess so. Um, no, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily asking about the higher power. I'm asking about yeah. the, the aspect of what is self-love without the other person in front of us. Oh, self-love is never, we can't love self only with somebody else in front of us <laughs> because then I have to love me as me, regardless of what anyone else thinks of me. Mm -hmm. I have to love me. I have a whole lot of exercises again in my book because learning to love ourselves is a really major part of healing from trauma because one of the belief systems most of us have is, and this is a child thinking, nobody helped me when I was being abused. Nobody noticed how much I was hurting. So mm -hmm. I can't really be very lovable and I can't matter. Mm -hmm. So one of the most important things in healing, first of all, is to learn that I can love myself. I am worthy of love. Mm -hmm. But the first person I have to learn to love me, if I get love just from externally, that's that, that I have to learn to love me. And then I can learn to love my pain, my fear, mm -hmm. and I can go to that fear and that pain. But I, mm -hmm. I have to develop what I call the adult self mm -hmm. to nurture and love the adult me. Mm -hmm. I have to you know, I have things like look in a mirror and just try to say every morning, I love myself. I love me. I'm a really super person. I'm really <laughs> worthwhile. And lots of survivors will say, oh, I, oh, I can't. I say, well, okay, just look at yourself and smile. Mm -hmm. you. Just smile. Mm -hmm. Just look and think. Just try. And it's, then, you know, just take it gently. But that's all the healing is about. Self-love is key to healing. Mm -hmm. as we have to love the adult self before the adult self can support the child self mm. who suffered the fear. So it's right. we take our own adult self with love to the child who is frightened. Mm -hmm. If I don't love me, I can't take my adult loving self to love my own pain and fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? No, that so makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. you said that beautifully in a way I've never heard it before of the importance of understanding ourselves in the present now, accepting ourselves in the present now so that we can go to that inner child that was harmed yeah. for that healing Absolutely. and uh, the importance of that self-love in the presence. Because if, if you have that self-love, when you have a panic attack, that adult self-love says, Oh, something dreadful happened in the past that's coming up for me, but I love myself enough to say, look, say I am frightened, look in the mirror and say, I feel scared. I feel scared, but it's okay because the adult me is, is okay. The adult mm -hmm. me is fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to, we have to build that strong inner adult self-love. Mm -hmm. I really, mm -hmm. um, there's one chapter that you talk about um, boundaries and yeah. 
this is, I'm kind of like learning where are my boundaries with um, my professional life, my personal life, and just everything else with like family members and friends. What are advice, what, what does your book say about boundaries? Oh, a lot. And, yeah. And <laughs> a lot. Because firstly, those of us who've suffered from trauma will have very poor boundaries because uh -huh. our boundaries, whether they were physical, emotional, sexual, will have been violated. So we won't really have had role modeling in what is a good boundary, what is okay for me to, to say is my right, and, and what is, um, and, you know, where to set my boundaries, where to say what's me and what's you. Mm -hmm. So whether it's physical boundaries, knowing that it's okay to say, no, I don't want to hug you. I don't want to hold your hand. Or whether mm -hmm. it's time boundaries, to say to a friend, no, sorry, I don't want to meet you for dinner. Mm -hmm. And the friend not to go into, oh, you don't like me anymore. Yes, I do. I just mm -hmm. not meeting you for dinner. Right. Um, so boundaries can be, we know we've got poor boundaries when we say no and mean yes, or when we say yes and mean no about mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. Money friend asked to borrow money. If I say yes and mean no, I've got poor boundaries. So anyone who ever thinks, oh, why did I do that? Oh, I should have said no. I should have said yes. Mm -hmm. Then you've got a poor boundary. Mm -hmm. And boundaries, good boundaries come as you start to love yourself. Mm -hmm. Our poor boundaries are wanting, not thinking we're worth it, not wanting our friends not to like us, not wanting to offend. Well, that's because we don't love ourselves enough. Mm -hmm. I love myself enough. I can just say to a friend, no, I'm really sorry. I'm not coming to your party. Right. However, if I love myself enough and I know it means an enormous amount to that friend to come mm -hmm. as I heal, I get to the stage of, I'll go to that party because I care about that person right. and love is reciprocal. So I will go, I won't just say no, I'll go because I know it'll give her pleasure. Mm -hmm. And isn't that also what life is about is giving, giving to others. Right. So there's, a, there's a balance. I think we all have to learn. Yeah. And does that, is the word we use. does that balance change as you, yeah. as you age? As, and as you heal, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Most survivors go through an absolute self-obsessed period and that's necessary to compensate for not being, you know, then can set really um, boundaries, which absolutely, this is me and no, you know, like, as right. I said, not, you know, suddenly saying, no, I'm not coming out to dinner when they said two days before they were going to all, all that sort of stuff. No, because I don't want to. And that's fine. But that's just a stage of healing. <laughs> ah. <laughs> awesome. Is there, um, what was like your favorite part writing the book? Um, uh, there wasn't really, I, I wrote the book because I thought after 20 years, I thought if I drop down dead, it's going to be a real waste of a life. So oh. I thought I better, I better, <laughs> I was talking at a big conference in London uh, in June last year. So yeah. I, thought, I know what I'm, I need to do. I'm going to write. I wrote it in three months. I just said, I know. I'm just going to sit down. I'm going to put down everything that I say. I'm going to mm -hmm. put in a book. Mm -hmm. And if I drop down dead, everything I've learned in 20 years is in this book. And that's, and that's good because it's good to have a record of what one has learned. Right. Because it may help others. And mm -hmm. then I can also keep on doing the things I'm doing, like um, training therapists and starting up Hill for Life in different parts of the world. And, and this stuff, other people can pass on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't need me to tell people this information. <laughs> You're leaving that legacy, which is awesome. Tell us a little bit about um, your clinic and what your approach is and how do you train therapists? Okay, so we have two sides. One, we have a program, which is a five-day program, which we run in England, the Philippines, Australia, and, and this year we start in India. Mm -hmm. And people keep talking to me from the, from the States, but it hasn't happened yet. But um, if, it, if it's meant to, it will. Right. Um, but basically what we provide is a safe place where survivors can come with no outside distractions mm -hmm. and feel safe enough to go into the fear they have not felt safe enough to do. Mm -hmm. So it... Rather than an hour in a therapist, when it's very hard to go into those painful areas we've never gone into, mm -hmm. I realized that for me, I needed somewhere where there was nothing else and I could just have five days for me. Mm -hmm. So that's the object is basically for people to have five days of just themselves, not thinking about the children, their family, their mum, whatever, but right. just for them. Um, and then to explore on an individual journey and do what I'm talking about, release the fear, learn tools, learn about the brain and, and get hope. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing that I now do a lot of is training therapists 
in how to do the same work in private practice because not everyone's going to be able to go away for five days. Right. It is, it's the Rolls Royce model. <laughs> but, but if therapists at least get less frightened of helping people to heal from, a lot of therapists are scared of emotions. You know, if, if a client mm. starts wailing, they, they want to stop it, you know, what's happening rather than saying, okay, just let yourself release all that what you're wailing about. Right. There's nothing, there's nothing scary in people unpacking their trauma, mm -hmm. um, but therapists learning about triggers and how to release um, the people. That's, that I found is I was surprised because I thought, <clears throat> I thought what we did wasn't very unusual. You see, I mm -hmm. thought it was kind of fairly obvious because I'm a survivor. Right. So I, I was a bit sort of surprised when I started training and it was so surprising to really experience trauma therapists. And I mm -hmm. thought, Oh, well, maybe what we do is, is fairly unique and maybe it really is important. And that's when I started really offering training. And, and now I realize it's really, really important because I'm a survivor of childhood trauma. So I really understand what we need because I've learned from thousands of other survivors and therapists want to help, but if they haven't done their own healing or haven't ever suffered from trauma, right. it's very hard for them. So I feel as if I'm the voice between uh, the health professionals, which of mm -hmm. course I am now, I've done all the training and got all the degrees, um, right. but between those people and survivors of trauma, I'm, I'm both and mm -hmm. I can explain it, but I also know from personal experience, you know, I've tried all the different therapies out of interest. See, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, EMDR, EFT, NLP, all of them. I tried them all because I thought I've got to just find out what's going to work for us. Right. So I feel quite confident, therefore, in, um, in saying, um, and our program isn't unique. It's just to me fairly obvious. It's what the scientists say. Mm -hmm. You have to release the fear from the fear center. Mm. And you can only do that by accessing the right brain. And you can only access the right brain through creative activities. Right. Um, yeah. It seems to me it's, a, and, and lots of therapists are doing it, but um, mm -hmm. obviously it's not in, in what we do. I think it's the combination of, of, of the acts that is, is unique. Right. And I want everyone to know, because if, if people read my book, then they can say to their therapist, hey, I want to do this. And then the therapist can do it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> quick question. Um, anger has been like a t hot topic on the show. Oh. And uh, with talking about releasing fear, because I know sometimes anger, fear can hide or sadness and grief can hide behind anger. Absolutely. What, what, um, I guess what's kind of like your protocol about releasing fear or not releasing, yeah, releasing, releasing fear when anger? through anger. Yeah. Oh no. Well, um, I mean, we've had, we have children's camps. We have the worst behaved kids in the States. And I've recently been in England working with a multi, you know, murderers, you know, in high security prisons. So uh -huh. uh, releasing anger is absolutely critical, but you can right. release anger if you come from your child self and you, if you release it physically, you can throw, I haven't got one here. You probably can't see, but you can throw something across the room. Right. And, and that's not going to hurt anyone because it's right. Mm -hmm. What I can't do is release my anger by yelling at someone or hitting them. Right. So what we, what we train um, kids in schools to do, the really badly behaved ones, the big bullies who are getting into real trouble, the ones who mm -hmm. are bashing up the other kids, they come on the healing week, they release their trauma, they realize that their anger, because boys release testosterone with their, with their stress hormones, and they realize that anger is covering their fear. So when they, mm -hmm. when they about to bash Johnny, they, they learn to run into the toilet. And they have a mirror in their pockets and they take it out and they look in the mirror and say, I feel frightened. Why do I feel? I feel frightened because Johnny mm -hmm. reminds me of my dad and he's putting me down. It's okay to feel frightened. I, I can let go of that fear. And they put the mirror back in their pocket and then they don't go and bash up Johnny and get expelled. And it's the same with adults. I was, being, wow. I was, I was doing this with guys in high security, really violent criminals yeah. and, and training their therapists. To, you can release anger. The most violent criminal can release anger safely, throwing a cushion or stamping, mm -hmm. letting the child release it. When we hold on to anger, when we rage, mm -hmm. when there's no release of our anger, or when we try anger management, we're mm -hmm. going against nature. We're going against mm -hmm. our brains. Mm -hmm. So for me, there's no such thing as anger management. <laughs> there's just anger <laughs> release. 
And yeah. I forget an enormous amount of the time. 90% of our emotions come from our childhood, they say. So, you know, when people have road rage, why do they have road rage? Because they're powerless and they were powerless as children. So they yell at the driver, but yeah. it'd be much better if they just could recognize, you know, and that mm-hmm. the powerlessness mm-hmm. is the fear and the anger is covering the fear. Mm-hmm. So for me, anger, release it, deal with it. Don't put it on anybody else. And right. so we do a lot of uh, here. We have, for instance, an anger pit where we have China. So people can break China into a pit. <laughs> and we have punching bags. Mm-hmm. And we have mattresses tied around trees. And we use children's um, rubber swords. So mm-hmm. we have lots of ways of people releasing their anger safely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we say to people, you know, have, have a punching bag at home. Have mm-hmm. a whole pile of cushions. Schools, I, I teach with schools. We work out in that school how the kids can safely release their anger. Mm-hmm. And, and in kindergartens, I've done it in kindergartens. They've had yeah. a place, they have a they have a place where kids, little kids can go and release their anger. It's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they just throw them and say, "I'm really angry. I'm cross because she took my." It's okay. It's okay to be angry. Like, yeah. It's not okay to yell at other people. It's right. It's not okay to do anything that hurts yourself or others. Mm-hmm. But you do have to release the anger. You can't suppress anger. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, I that's love. My, take on anger. <laughs> I, I love what the, the mirror aspect, the little pocket mirror. That's brilliant. That's because um, the optical neurons are the strongest right. neurons we have. So they connect immediately. So that's how right. adults see trigger as well. Uh-huh. But I was not thinking of these, really some of the boys particularly we have, they're such, you know, bruh, and I just love the thought of them running in the toilet and looking. And I think if, if they're the kids who hate them or, or you know, you can see them, they go, what? <laughs> <laughs> It works very effectively. Yeah, yeah. Well, awesome. And, well, it, you know, it stops them doing violent things or committing violent crimes as they get older, and that's that's what's important. Right. It's everybody, um, you know, out of their pain, it doesn't hurt. Do, do not hurt other people. Mm-hmm. At the very beginning of our conversation, before I hit the record button, um, we're about to wrap it up. Um, we were talking about the child trauma and why we don't necessarily really recognize it. Do you remember us? Can you talk a little bit more of like why we aren't necessarily fully recognizing a lot of these issues that we are dealing with as an adults with medications? I think, uh, yeah, I think we started talking about it actually on air, but, but one thing we didn't discuss was the fact that, well, two things. Firstly, sometimes we don't want to recognize it because yes. it involves one of our parents. Yeah love our parents and maybe we, we, we're trying to repair the relationship or they're old and, and we don't want to hurt them, but we can heal from stuff that our parents did to us. Mm-hmm. With, and that will actually make our relationship in the now better, not mm-hmm. worse, make it mm-hmm. better because we get rid of the childhood anger mm-hmm. and we love them for who they are because our parents are always our parents. Mm-hmm. Our parents, you know, it, they may be flawed and terrible and do dreadful things but but they still gave birth to us so half of me is still my father you know it doesn't matter right. what half of me it, and all the good things that my father had which were many and and, and extraordinary so there, mm-hmm. so um there was something else i was going to say about that um in the one of the reasons uh, it's not quite answering your question uh, but i'm going to say it anyway um in the 1970s there was a big backlash particularly in the states because people started realizing the vast majority of childhood trauma comes from dysfunctional parenting. Right. And so there was a great blaming of parents. So mm. now for the last 40 years, we've all, everyone's been bending over backwards not to blame the parents. Right. And I, and I think we have to kind of go, yes, parenting does create these problems, but it's kind of like, it's not your fault because if you're poorly parented, you poorly parent, you poorly right. parent, it's intergenerational. Right. And the moment we all stop blaming and just say, Everybody does the best they can. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to be a violent, awful parent. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're suffering from their own trauma, their own stuff. So the, mm-hmm. the sooner we all have compassion, mm-hmm. both that's why we need to have compassion for perpetrators because mm-hmm. after all, they're just kids who are hurt as kids. They're just, they're mm-hmm. just survivors who their, their pain has overwhelmed them. And I can't make judgment on other people i think the main thing we have to stop is getting people to realize learning how to parent well Mm -hmm. those first two years of life are absolutely critical Mm -hmm. for the welfare of our society that we must really really help mothers have those bonds have security consistency Mm -hmm. in the first two years of life so Mm -hmm. everybody has a chance to grow into a beautiful human being 
mm-hmm. and and every and, and mothers need every bit of support mm-hmm. to help them. And mothers who didn't have that don't know how to parent can't go on parenting courses because all they do is feel inadequate. They have to learn mm. they have to heal their trauma before mm-hmm. they can learn to be good mothers mm. or good fathers. You know? Yeah. Um, it's only last week on a, on Thursday when we talk about parent, that one woman said, "Am I meant to play with? Am I meant to play with my children?" Aww. You know, and the, she had a five year old and a three year old. Am mm. I meant to play with my children? Yes, you are. Mm-hmm. Hmm. You know, but she didn't know. Her mother didn't yeah. play. Yeah. How, how do you know? That almost that? makes me want. Like that makes me, my eyes tear up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, it's really sad. And about she, she, that's, you can't know what you're not. Just one moment. Um, you can't know what you haven't been taught. Right. Stop at the door. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Liz. I'll let you go. You have a, a massive amount of knowledge and wisdom. So thank you so much for being on the show. And I look I, I do to- encourage, do encourage any of your yes. listeners, get my book. <laughs> yes, I will. Go on Amazon, go on, you know. Get all it. the all the info will be in the show notes and this will be live Sunday. Um, Cause I believe your book's coming out this coming week. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Right. yep. It'll be yeah. out on Sunday for the book and um, to help the healing process continue. Thank you, Anna. Yes. Thank I'm you, Liz. Sure you. Okay. Yes. Bye. Bye.